This is Just a Few Questions. I'm Mark Sims. My guest is Bill Ayers, a retired, distinguished professor of education and senior a university scholar at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Welcome to the show, William Ayers. Great to be here, Mark. Thank you so much. And I did this introduction before we went on. You said you're, you're retired, but you still teach. Well, I'm retired from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And what that means, I've been retired since I was 65, and I'm now almost 80. So I've been retired for almost 15 years. And uh, what it means is I don't have to go to faculty meetings or meet with the dean, which is just terrific. But I am teaching, and I teach, um, mostly I teach at Stateville Prison in a college degree granting program in uh, Joliet, Illinois. I teach at DePaul University, teach at Lake Forest College. So I'm still teaching. But I'm not going to faculty meetings, which is a blessing. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, okay. Although you're quote unquote retired, I still don't want to take up a lot of your time. So let's get right into it. William Ayers, Bill Ayers, how can a school system like the Chicago Public Schools transform students who struggle academically, socially, poverty, et cetera, et cetera? How can they do that? Well, you know, I, I guess I would start with a slightly different premise, which is. You know, I, I think we have to transform the system. I don't think we need to transform the kids so much as we need to, or the families, so much as we need to transform a system because the system we have is failing kids massively. It's failing all kids a little bit. It's failing poor kids and kids who come from immigrant families from, you know, poor nations or from African ancestored people, um, fail, failing them miserably. And we're we're really creating a kind of a sharecropper education for the poor. And so the system has to be transformed. So let's talk for a minute about that. Um, you know, I consider education a human right, fundamental. It's a basic community responsibility. It's a human right. And that means that every child, simply by being born, has the right to free, accessible, high-quality public education. It means decent, generously staffed school facility must be an easy reach for every family. And it's not difficult to imagine. You know why? Because what the rich and powerful have for their kids in communities like Lake Forest and Winnetka around here, or communities like Shaker Heights in Cleveland, or you, know, you, you name it, the privileged have for their kids what every kid deserves, which is small class sizes, a physics and chemistry lab, after school, a full arts program, you know, um, a, a full sports program, and so on. That's the baseline of what we want for every child. If we want anything less than that, then we're really destroying not only education, but democracy itself. So I, I start from that premise, Mark. I say, you know, if, if education in a free and democratic society, even a putatively or aspirationally free and democratic society, uh, if that's the horizon, if freedom is the horizon, then we've got to kind of disrupt the dead weight of fruit competition, monstrous individualism, and the legacy of white supremacy. We have to change all those things. So that's where I begin. Um, and I think we should, be, we should be having a massive national conversation in every village and hamlet, every city and neighborhood around the question of what makes a good school? What does it mean to build free schools for free people? Well, as you all know, you are a distinguished professor. We we are in the uh, the land of the free, in the home of the slaves. And <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase. Man. Well, you, you know, you know, you know the phrase very well. And, and so we 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 never really we've never done that. And the people That's who true. are in the system, the people we. Um, I mean, we have a, I'm not to beat up on Brandon, Mayor Brandon Johnson. We have a progressive mayor. We have a progressive uh, CTU, Chicago Teachers Union. Are they trying to change the system? Well, you know, I think, I think in some ways they are. And I'm sympathetic to both those entities, uh, sympathetic to the mayor. Although I, I, you know, I think like everybody thinks he's made some unforced errors. And, and the CTU and, and the progressive board, I think they're trying. But here's the problem. We don't go deep enough, and we don't go deep enough either in terms of what is our goal. That's why I raised the big question. What does it mean to build successful free public schools for all kids? What does it mean to say education is a human right? It certainly means you wouldn't have a school in one place that's a state-of-the-art palace of learning 
and 20 miles south have a place that's really a prison uh, in effect. You wouldn't allow that because it's a human right. And I think that's where we have to start. But starting there, I would say that it's, you know, we, we spend too much time looking at the sites of power that we don't have full access to. And we kind of hope that if we elect a Brandon Johnson or we elect a Barack Obama, that somehow they'll solve our problems. That's not true. What we need is an irresistible social movement demanding freedom and equality, but in terms of education, demanding that education is a human right with all the implications of that. So that means for me, I, you know, one of my touchstones is the freedom schools in Mississippi in the 1960s. That's where I got my start. That's what I believe we have to kind of look to around the country. And what were the freedom schools? They were schools that were started in the kind of in the midst of the civil rights movement, in the midst of a social movement. And what those schools were based on was this, that, that people looked around and said, the schools of Mississippi have been deny, denying black kids many things, fully funded schools, fully, uh, you know, fully realized uh, facilities, fully trained teachers. But the fundamental injury is that they've denied kids the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they might be different. And that is a revolutionary thing to say. It's revolutionary in 1963 in Mississippi. It's revolutionary on the west side of Chicago right now. What are the circumstances of your lives? And what do you need to do and what do you need to have in order to live differently? And I think we should start there. And then I think we can do a lot of particular reforms, but I don't think it makes sense to approach it in piecemeal fashion without raising the fundamental questions of what is a decent education, a free, public, accessible education for all as a human right, as a community responsibility. Well, many Americans, are, let's say half, a lot of people are doing okay, whatever that means. They're doing just fine. They're making over seventy five grand, $175,000 a year, and they say, listen here, my children, are going to be okay. Why should I advocate a better education system for those children, those lower class families, those lower class children? Why should I care about them? Well, you know, one of the problems I think with, uh, with the kind of toxic individualism that dominates so much of our culture, um, one of the problems with it is that we begin to define things in very, very everything gets defined in individualistic terms, and yet everything has a social uh, dimension that we often don't take into account. And what I mean by that is we can say family values means my two kids or, um, you know, public safety means I own a gun or, you know, and so on. We go down that road where everything's about me, me, me. The problem with that is you say maybe half the people are doing okay, but even they know that their position is precarious. That is, the job market is precarious. The entire system is resting on these kind of privileges and oppressions that are traditional and yet uh, make us all unfree. I refer back again and again to James Baldwin who and Franz Fanon both who, who pointed out that when black people are free, they will also free white people. Free white people from what? Free them from the precarious position of, free, of, of blindness, the precarious position of privilege that they know has to come to an end, that they know is unjust. It's the same with, take any, anything you can name, same with men and women. When women are liberated, men will also be free. Free from what? Free from that precarious position of privilege, which is not only unjust, but mainly it's blinding. It, it interferes with your humanity. And I think Baldwin was the clearest speaker on this for, for decades, that it's really... When you dehumanize another people, the, the, the hidden but very obvious um, at some point uh, result of that is you dehumanize yourself. And we can see it everywhere. You can see it in conquering armies. You can see it right now in the, in the, uh, the pre-announced genocide in Gaza. I mean, it's, it's certainly it's horrific what's happening to the Palestinian people with all these mystifications and justifications. But look what's happening to the Israelis. They are dehumanizing themselves in doing this. And I think that's something we have to keep into account. Well, let me go from uh, dehumanizing to uh, demystifying, if I can. When, sure, I, when, I hear, when I hear talk of education, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, public radio. 
And so with public radio or some YouTube video, I hear, especially in Chicago, it's probably across the country, too. You, I hear a lot of politics and power when people discuss education, but I don't hear much about teaching and learning. So, Bill Ayers, how can in, the, in these failing public schools, blah, 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 how can an educator or a principal or, a, you know, whoever, how can they demystify this thing called learning for that for those average students in the hood, outside the hood, in a, in a low income suburb, whatever, wherever they are, rural areas? How can they demystify learning? So they say, I, I can get this. I can understand this stuff. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it gets tied up in politics, power, mystification. But I think it's not that complex. There's two things I would say that are that are hopeful. One is that even though we say the system is failing, you go into almost any school in Chicago and you will find teachers doing what you might call quote God's work. That is, they're doing the difficult work of of teaching in a way that is really effective and hopeful and and helpful. So I think it's already happening. Second thing is, if you want to look at learning, if you want to understand learning, you can start with a two-year-old or start with a one-year-old. You know, I often think back to, I guess it was 47 years ago when our first child was born at home and the midwife had long, complicated labor. And the midwife wrapped the baby up and put him on his mother's breast. And I often asked my students over the years, who was teaching whom how to nurse? And the obvious answer, once you take a close look at it, is they were in dialogue. Obviously, mom knew a lot of things. She knew how to hold the baby. She talked to her midwife. She talked to her sister. You know, she joined La Leche League. But she wasn't the only expert in the room. The other expert was the baby who was saying, no, not here, there. Not this way, that way. Not this much, that much. And the dialogue begins. Watch any three-year-old in a public playground Watch him in a sandbox, and you'll see that that kid is learning all the time. It's not mystifying. It's it's miracle. It's it's fascinating, but it's not complicated. And what I mean by that is you have to start thinking about education from the student, from the individual to the social, from the psychological to the logical. You don't start with a curriculum built by some uh, you know bureaucracy or some. Uh, expert from a university and then impose it on kids, you start with the kids themselves because the desire to learn, and you know this from your own life, the desire to learn, the desire to grow, the desire to become more confident, more capable is inherent. It's not something you need to impose from the outside. Nobody tells that three-year-old in the playground, you're a target of instruction and I'm going to impose this learning on you. Rather, we say, here's some shovels, here's some pails, Go make sense of, of life for yourself. And that kid is experimenting all the time and learning crazy fast. Watch a two-year-old. I mean, I have to, my youngest grandchild is two. My eldest is 19 and off to college. But my youngest is two. And being with him is just a miracle. Watching the language develop, watching the motor skills develop, watching the socialization develop. It's inside him. And we need to provide an environment that's rich enough and deep enough and provocative enough and strange enough to provoke him to keep going. Uh, there, but there are teachers who may be listening to this, educators, administrators, and they say, uh, Bill Evans, I feel you, I agree with everything you're saying, but I'm here in the hood, or I'm in a you know, Chicago public school, low-income neighborhood, in a suburb, a low-income suburb, a low-income rural area, and sure. all this uh, family and low-income poverty dysfunction, I got to deal with this dysfunction every day. How do I help that student with all this dysfunction that they come in the room with every day? Well, first of all, I want to I want to um, I want to kind of challenge that just to a small degree. You're absolutely right, of course, to some degree. But it's also true that every kid comes to school, every kid, five, every five year old comes to kindergarten, having mastered an, an amazing amount of stuff, can talk mostly, um, can speak, can communicate. Um, can express desires, can feed himself, can, you know, put on his pants. I mean, in other words, it's not all deficit. It's also asset. So you have to start with asset. That's number one. Number two, I, what I see teachers doing all the time, even with all the external demands, even with all the, the difficulties and challenges they face, I see teachers creating classrooms with, which are rich and deep and complex. What I mean by that is I see them creating classrooms that are literate, that is, that have, you know, um, massive um, 
uh, opportunities to pick up books, to pick up magazines, to write, to communicate, um, that have uh, blocks and, and, and toys and uh, materials, clay and paint. So the kids in their normal behavior are beginning to construct a world. Watch any five-year-old at an easel where you put red, yellow, and and uh, red, yellow, and blue paint, and watch kids work at that easel. And one of the this happened to me when I was teaching young kids every day. Somebody would come to me and said, "Bill, look, red and blue, it's purple." I wasn't instructing them in primary and secondary colors, and I could have said if I were a certain kind of teacher, "Of course, stupid, weren't you paying attention when I did the." primary and secondary colors lesson, but I wouldn't do that. Rather, I would say, really, what else can you do? What else can you discover? What else can you create? Because it's in the act of creation that we, we build in kids a sense of agency, a sense of power. And those are the things that carry them um, into the next learning and the next. You and I were fortunate that we had that happen to us. We also had teachers who weren't very good but we also had opportunities in school and outside of school to create the world, to make sense of the world. And that's why we're able to get along with our, by the way, with yours and my finite knowledge in an infinite and complex world, we get along because we've been able to use those things we do know uh, as leverage to, to learn the next things and the next. I am almost done, but I, I got it. We talk we, on this podcast. We talk about public safety and stuff. So here, everybody know about Chicago, oh, Chicago, right? The crime. So yeah. and, and I know how it was when I went when I was in grammar school fifty five years ago, <laughs> probably more. Right. But the point is that it's always been just a few a percentage, a small percentage of students that disrupt the whole classroom. There's always a small percentage of students uh, who become neighborhood criminals that destabilize that neighborhood. So when we talk about crime in Chicago, even rural area, suburban area, whatever, how do we help that small percentage of students not become neighborhood criminals? Well, in a classroom, I know how to do it. And I can say a word about the community at large. But in the classroom, what you have to do is create a situation where people want to be there and the, and the classroom governs itself to some degree. In other words, um, in other words, we have two models. One model is uh, I go over to do Sabal High School 25 years ago. And in the lunchroom, there's a big uh, sign on the wall saying rules for the lunchroom. No running, no uh, food fights, no um, yelling, no uh, 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 fork fights. And look at that fork fight. So I wonder what happened 10 years prior that put that on the list, you know? I mean, in other words, there's a way of thinking about a classroom or a school that's all about rules that are imposed. That are, but, but here's another model. Same year that I went to see this, um, this sign in the Jusabo cafeteria, I was in a fifth grade. And in the opening of school, the teacher says, okay, I want to I wanna talk about the, school, the classroom rules, first day of school, fifth graders. He says, first rule is you can chew gum. Oh, my God, all the 10-year-olds are like, wow. This teacher is an absolute rebel. We can chew gum. It's some, somehow a capital crime in the rest of the school. Yeah, you can chew gum, but don't put it under the desk, throw it in the wastebasket. Number two, um, you, you, you can eat in the classroom. Wow, this guy is crazy. Number three, you can wear your hats. Now, here are three rules that in the school are just stupid and make 10-year-olds want to rebel. He says, those, those, those are the first three rules. Next rule is, we're a learning community. We have to respect one another and one another's work. Now, what has he done? He's created a standard by which learning to live together becomes the ethos of the classroom. In other words, it's not a set of, it's not the idea of imposing rules and enforcing them. It's the idea of buy, getting people to buy into a standard that we are living together and we are learning to live together. If you start teaching that way, in kindergarten, first grade, fifth grade. That's how we bring people into the community. And frankly, I've, I've always had kids who are misbehaving and so on and so on. But the community itself takes care of it. I'll, I'll give you one quick example from outside of school. Go look at any, any um, basketball court in Chicago on a summer day, and you will see 10, 12, 20 kids self-governing. And how, why do they? And they don't. They argue and they complain and they shout, but 
but they are self-governing because the game makes them want to play. The game is the thing, and therefore we're all committed to the game, and therefore we'll sort out the question of was it a foul, wasn't it a foul, was it illegal, wasn't it illegal. The problem we have in the larger community is we're basing safety and disruption on policing and not on something much more positive than that, which is community building. And I know that the resources going into the Chicago police are wasted resources. They do not create safety. We create safety when we have the kinds of schools that we need that I was describing earlier, when we have the kind of parks and playgrounds that we need, when we have the kind of activities that are productive that draw people into. And look, all teenagers want something to belong to and something to produce. If we could draw them into that, we draw them away from the destructive. Well, Bill Ayers, thank you for being my guest. And I, I cannot thank you enough, seriously. But if you got a few more seconds, a few more, a minute or so, give a little inspiration for those educators who are fighting against a system that is designed to produce workers and not thinkers. You're exactly right. I mean, that's why when I referenced the Mississippi Freedom Schools, I said, you know, the fundamental injury is that the lack of intellectual freedom, the lack of the ability to think for ourselves about the conditions of our lives. I want to produce thinkers and doers. I don't want to just pr produce a workforce of worker bees. And so what's the inspiration? The inspiration is that when you're a teacher, you really are doing, you are the vocation of vocations because you are at the crossroads of all other choices that human beings are going to make. I think teaching is the most noble calling, and the most challenging. I mean, because you can never put yourself on automatic pilot. Teaching is relational work. You build new relations every year. I started teaching in 1965. I go into a classroom today. I'm still, when I start school, I'm still a little full of dread. Will this work out? How will it go? I mean, I trust myself and I trust, you know, some of the things I've learned along the way. But I know that every classroom is different. Every classroom is its own challenge. And sometimes they work better than other times. But I think that teachers should take heart from the fact that they're doing intellectual and ethical work. And there's very few other professions where you can say every day, my work really opens or closes doors for all kinds of other human beings.